I came to the MBL in the summer of 1974. I had just finished my PhD at MIT. I was working on translational control in sea urchin eggs. I was working in the lab of Paul Gross, who would later go on to be a director of the MBL. And I took the embryology course, and it changed my life. <laughs> In 1976, I was invited to come back and teach in the embryology course. And I actually lived both summers in Swope, in room 323 that overlooked Eel Pond. It was wonderful. And um, this was the beginning of molecular biology. And again, we had a whole different crew of people coming, of experts in the field coming through. And I got to see the organism that I would first spend that I would spend a lot of my time doing work on the clam spigula, the eggs of the clam. This is my 41st year at the MBL, so um, there, there are going to be a few favorite memories. Um, being part of an intense summer research community is a favorite memory for every single year that I've been here. Um, to change and novelty are very important to scientists. It just stimulates people when they move from one environment to another. They have new next door neighbors, they're living next to new scientists, they're eating next to new scientists in the cafeteria, and you just talk about all sorts of things, and you get new ideas, you, under, you hear about new techniques, people ask you questions you hadn't thought about, it really reformulates your ability to, to kind of be more incisive in your thinking. In the old days, the Board of Trustees was composed almost entirely of working scientists. And that began to, and so I was elected to the Board of Trustees during that time. And then the makeup of the board became to change, so it had a more sort of professional board, uh, people with experience in finance and business. And so I had uh, stayed on the board, had gone off, and was um, back on the board. And then I was uh, at Gary Borsi, the former director, asked me if I would be Speaker of the MBL Corporation. And I agreed, so then I was a part of the executive committee. And when Gary announced his decision to retire, the board approached me and asked me if I would take on the directorship of the MBL. So I had closed my lab uh, recently. I was much more involved with as a uh, science advisor to the Radcliffe Institute. And I thought this was a terrific time for me to give back to the institution. So I said yes, after a lot of trepidation, because I had not ever done anything as large as that before. The most wonderful thing about being director was working as a part of a team here. So I just told you about working with scientists. I mean, you know, in science, you always collaborate with members in your lab, you collaborate with your collaborators, that's what the word means. But really, you're always competing in science. You're competing to, you're, you're trying to find a discovery. And usually you're working in a field where other people are focused on the same question. And you'd like to get there first. It's no fun getting there eight months or a year afterwards. So being head of an institution is completely different. You are absolutely working together as a team with everybody all the time. And I had never experienced that um, to such a degree. It was wonderful. It was just a wonderful team when I came here. So that was uh, a surprise, and it still forms a really nice memory. In 2012, um, it became apparent that um, the MBL, like many other independent research institutions, actually many, acad many academic institutions in general, was really suffering from the combined effects of a slowed economy, economy the reduction in federal funding, increasing expense in, uh, in, in doing academic research, uh, and the model of the MBL as an independent research institution was 
really tough to continue. And the board decided to look into the possibility of affiliating with a major research university in order to address not only um, the financial issues, but larger infrastructural ones. You know, here at the MBL, we need one of everything that a major research university has. Um, it's very expensive for us to do that. And it's also, you know, we don't have access to sort of the intellectual capital of universities, the deep experience in personnel or IT or research safety or um, any, any of the major de development, things like that, even though we do a very good job here with what we've got. So when I first started, um, let's see, my first day was November 4th, Monday, November 4th. Um, I had gone up to Boston to um, introduce a seminar speaker late in the afternoon. And I came back, and at 7.30 the next morning, we met with the president of Brown University, Christina Paxson, her provost, <laughs> um, the, their CFO, their head of development, their uh, dean of the medical school to talk about um, possibility of affiliating with Brown University, which with whom we already had a joint PhD program. Uh, at 12.30, we said goodbye to them. <laughs> and at 1 o'clock, we welcomed a team from the University of Chicago. <laughs> so that pretty much marked the first six months of what, um, what I was doing. Um, in the end, we had to make a decision um, on who, whether we were going to pursue exclusive discussions with Brown University or with the University of Chicago. And it was a very tough decision. Um, we had many good relations with Brown. They were close by, relatively speaking, 70 miles. Uh, we had interesting historical ties to the University of Chicago. The first and second directors of the MBL were faculty members from the University of Chicago. I think um, more than 50% of the first summer faculty at, in, in, in MBL summer courses from, from the University of Chicago. Uh, uh, Chicago was very interested in environmental sciences here. Um, the MBL is extremely strong in ecosystem sciences. Uh, Chicago is very strong in economics and social policy. And so this seemed to be, it would like to be a very good synergy with them. They were also very interested in giving uh, their undergraduates the opportunity to come to um, a lab on a marine coast, uh, take summer courses, uh, take part of our semester in environmental sciences for undergraduates. So there, there were plus, you know, there were real strengths and pluses for becoming an affiliate of either one. So it was a tough decision to make. So in the end, we decided that we would pursue exclusive discussions with Chicago. So that was in January of 2013. Um, the MBL has an unusual governance. It has an independent board, but it also has a corporation. That, uh, the MBL Corporation, which had 583 active scientists who had to approve um, this affiliation. So the board was very in favor of this, by and large. But the scientists, most of whom were summer scientists, many of whom had been coming for many, many years, um, many of whom uh, liked the MBL the old way, um, did not want to give up its autonomy to another university, and um, there, was, there were many people who said they were going to vote against this affiliation. And if that happened, this would really have meant the MBL, the end of the MBL as we knew it. So we worked very hard on uh, a series of communications. I wrote a lot of letters to MBL corporation members. I talked to them on the phone, I answered a lot of I write emails. Um, 
June 1st, we had a, a special meeting of the MBL Corporation. So normally, the MBL Corporation met um, the first Friday of every August. So we, we couldn't wait that long. So we met on Saturday, June 1st, and there was going to be a vote. And we I had developed a presentation. I mean, people came here from as far away as the West Coast in order to vote against this. So we'd set out that we had a lunch for everybody, and then we we're going to have a, uh, a closed corporation meeting. You, you had to be a corporation member and on the list to get in, no press, no people, um, no community members who weren't corporation members, um, um, because we needed a legally binding vote. So, uh, I gave a presentation. Uh, we had uh, David Green, who is the executive vice president from the University of Chicago, uh, give his views of what an affiliation with Chicago would mean to the MBL and how, uh, how productive and stabilizing it would be. He told people, uh, he told corporation members what the financial arrangements would be. I think people were very pleased to hear that. Um, and then we called for the vote. And we had no idea what was going to happen. And because we thought it was going to be a very close vote, we asked people um, to stand up and hold up. Everyone had a green card that they were um, given an admittance because we had some elderly people who had to be assisted by non-corporation members. So those, the, 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 the helpers didn't have cards. So I asked people to stand up and hold up their card if they were in favor of it. And there was a pause, and then the entire auditorium rose. <laughs> um, and it was a wave, and it was uh, just amazing. And everyone looked around, uh, and there was silence. And I realized that we had succeeded, that this was going to happen, we had succeeded. And then I remembered, oh, I should ask if there were any people opposed. So the, 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 the eyes sat down, and I called for any people who were opposed, and two people got up and held up their cards. So I wrapped my gravel, <laughs> gavel and declared the vote a success, and then we went and had a cocktail party. One of the special, almost unique things about the MBL is the ability for scientists to come here and work hands-on and collaborate with other scientists, adult scientists. You can rent a lab and work yourself in the lab with another scientist on a particular project. Um, so the MBL provides housing, it provides lab space, lab support. So I did this for several summers with Tim Hunt, and we published many articles together. It was, um, you know, we would correspond during the academic part of the year, and they would really work intensely when we got here. And then I did that for several more years with Avram Hershko, um, who came from the Technion in Israel. So we was, we, in June, we would set up a little clam lab, and then you know, at the end of September, we would ship back all our samples and work on them through the rest of the academic year. So you really get to know um, people in a very different way when you're working in a, in a small room, you know, four, five, sometimes six people in a 400-square-foot room. So you get to really understand what the students and graduate students and postdocs are, frust are, are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, and they get to see what you, faculty members, have to deal with besides all the experiments, all the telephone calls. In those days, there were phone calls and faxes. That was before email. Um, and uh, it, it just, um, it was you, a very special experience, basically working in such tight quarters with people in such a beautiful area. You, know, you could go to the beach and continue talking. You could go to the food boy. It used to be called that then. The Woods Hole Market now. You could go to the, the MBL Laundry. And there's always somebody to talk to about science. When you live in the cottages um, and you're out there pushing your kids on swings with another scientist, it, you just, um, 
get the opportunity to meet and, and become friends with all, so many different people from so many different areas of science.